Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Xavier Lavandeira. We are now um, preparing uh, the, the start of a seminar by Christian de Pertui uh, here in Florence, the Day of Europe. Uh, our institution is, 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 is very happy in this day. We've been uh, organizing several things in the last uh, few days related to the Day of Europe, the State of the Union last uh, week, um, different parties uh, during the weekend, and, and today even in Florence there is this Erasmus Day. So um, for us, uh, it is a pleasure today, this day, to have uh, Christian de Pertui here to give a seminar on the EU ETS reforms. Um, people working in this field of climate policies know well uh, Christian. He's a professor of economics at Paris Dauphin University. And uh, he's head of the climate economics uh, chair uh, there. Um, he's been working for many years in, in pricing for for environmental policies and particularly for climate policies. Um, he wrote uh, several papers, books on this topic. One of the, book, of the books, by the way, uh, with Denny, with Denny Ellerman, the former director of, of this uh, unit. So for us, it's, it's a pleasure to have him here. Um, I'm going to give the, the, the floor um, to him in a while. Uh, he will speak for about 40, 45 minutes. And I want to, to remind you, um, the followers outside Florence, that you can send your questions to the email that we provided in the, in the pub publicity of this, of, this, uh, work of this workshop, of this seminar, which is FSR Climate Streaming at EUI.eu. Uh, after uh, we finish the, the, the presentation, after we, we hear, uh, listen, we, we listen, we, f we finish listening, uh, Christian's presentation will uh, open the, the floor both to, to people uh, attending this seminar here in Florence and to those outside. Thanks, uh, Christian, for being here, and the floor is yours. Sorry. Thank you, Xavier. It's always. Uh, Great pleasure to join Florence and to be in your institute. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here because um, five years ago, uh, I was invited in such a workshop on EUTS uh, by Denis Lerman, who um, was here at that moment. And uh, the question was a little bit the same as today. Uh, reforming the EUTS, what, what should we do? And five years ago, my recommendation was to move the governance of the EUTS to uh, set up a new uh, body, which could be called a central bank of carbon or an independent um, management uh, organization, and to stay in the field of uh, managing the UTS through quantities. Five years has, have passed, and today we have the same question. How to reform the UTS, uh, taking into consideration the experience of those five years, I've changed a bit my mind. And today, what I would like to discuss with you is uh, how to combine uh, price and quantity management. And I do think that it would be extremely difficult to uh, reform the UETS using a pure quantity management. This will be the uh, thesis uh, I would like to defend. And I don't know how I have to use this. Like this. Should be like this now. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, 
I would like to discuss this point in three uh, parts. The first, uh, I just would like to ask, sorry for this little technical problem. So uh, outline uh, three moments in the discussion. First, do we need a carbon price signal? Uh, in Europe, we see that uh, Obviously, uh, the UTS doesn't send any carbon price signals, uh, significant carbon price signal for the last five or six years, but we still have climate policy. You know. Do we need a carbon price signal? This will be my first point. I, my answer will be yes. Uh, second point, I would like to uh, remind you uh, what is at stake with this reform, and I think that we have to understand what are the roots of the shortcomings of the UTS? What are the real difficulties? Because if we want to set up uh, an efficient reform, the reform has to cure the illness, not the symptom of the illness. And third, I would like to defend the idea that uh, the uh, UTS reform should uh, change a little bit the way it is uh, now uh, pushed by the European Commission, and we should move toward the com uh, combined price and quantity based management instead of re re remaining in a pure quantity management. So first part, uh, do we need a carbon price signal? My, my answer will be yes, both considering the short-term issues and the long-term issues. First, considering the short-term issues, uh, there is a very nice example of uh, what happened in uh, two a comparable economy inside the uh, European Union, the so Germany and the UK, in which uh, in Germany uh, the uh, power companies operate with the EU interest carbon price, which is, I remind you, below uh, six euro per ton for the last four years, and uh, the UK, uh, in which the uh, company operates with a specific carbon price which is supported by a national tax and which is above the uh, UETS carbon price. We see that since the introduction of this price floor in the UK, the uh, British uh, emission uh, from the capped uh, entities has decreased by almost uh, not 40, but uh, 35 percent in uh, four years, and that in uh, the uh, Germany uh, there is uh, almost no decrease in the uh, emission in the uh, capped entities. Just a point which is important, of course, uh, the decrease in the emission in the UK doesn't decrease the global level of uh, European entities because the cap is uh, Europe, European and not countries vast countries. This means that the carbon price floor in the UK contribute to the disequilibrium of the market at the European level. This is why when the French government uh, decided to, not decided, but proposed to introduce a national carbon price uh, last year in France, uh, our uh, climate chair uh, in Dauphine uh, assessed the project and told the government that it wasn't a good policy to set up uh, national uh, price floors. Uh, do we need a carbon price uh, from a medium and long term standpoint? Uh, I think uh, a major uh, point is that uh, if we want to move toward a low carbon economy, we need to not just to add new energy sources and to low uh, carbon energy sources. We need very rapidly to phase out from fossil fuels. We need to disinvest from, from this. And this uh, point, uh, I think, is uh, in terms of economy, uh, very important. Uh, it's a story I call uh, carbon rent against oil rent. If you look at the way uh, the oil industry is investing, it's a very long story, uh, which has been uh, um, represented by hoteling. When the oil price is low, just a part of the deposits are, are um, 
profitable, but uh, when the oil price is low, you give a very strong incentive to increase the consumption of oil. And when the price is high, you give an incentive to reduce the consumption of oil, but you give a very strong incentive to uh, try to find new uh, resources of oil. So I think the economics of oil grant is an extremely dangerous economy in which when the oil price is low, you, uh, incent you send a strong incentive to the consumption, and when it increases, you give very strong in incentive to produce more and more oil. How to cope with this dilemma? I think the good way to cope with this dilemma is to introduce a carbon price. And if you introduce a carbon price, you change the rules. And you have another story of rent. It's the story of the carbon rent. When the carbon price at the international level would be at, uh, you can say, 20 or 30 euro per ton of CO2. You just phase out from coal. You just don't any invest anymore in coal because the content of CO2 uh, in coal is too high and it's not uh, profitable to invest in coal. And the more you increase the carbon price, the more you increase the carbon rent, which means the more you will increase the profitability of the investment in low carbon price and the less you will incentive the players to invest in fossils. So I think the story of the need of a carbon price is extremely clear in the short run, in the short run in Europe and in other um, market economy, if you don't have a carbon price, it's much more difficult to reduce uh, CO2 emission, and it's very difficult to reduce them uh, with cost efficiency. And in the long run, if you want to uh, disinvent from the fossil fuels, you have to introduce this long-term CO2 price. So, what is our experience uh, in the UETS uh, from this point of view? I remind you that the ETS started in 2005, 12 years ago. And uh, I want to describe the brief history of UETS because it would take uh, not 40 minutes, but uh, 40 hours. But uh, what you can uh, have in mind is that uh, this um, UTS is constructed through different phases, and uh, we have entered now in the third phases, and we are preparing the fourth phases. Uh, you see that um, the more you, we, enter, we develop this um, complex scheme, the less this scheme is visible, is uh, understandable from uh, the public. And uh, I would say uh, a brief history of UTS led to three main results. First, more complexity. It's extremely impressive how the rules of the UTS become more complex, more sophisticated from one period to the second period, to the third period, and to the fourth period. Uh, I can take some examples, but uh, I would be very brief. Uh, I have in our team, we have uh, Rafael Trottignon, who is probably one of the best experts in this uh, field, and he knows much better than me the details of the rules. But for example, if we look at the rules for the free allocations, uh, the rules for the third phases are extremely complex. I, I know you had a seminar, I think, I, 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 here on, on this. They are very complex because we combine uh, different approaches. And if you look uh, in the details, <coughs> for example, for the third thesis, you have benchmark rules, which are quite sophisticated because different from one sector to another, which are combined with historical reference because each installation can choose between two years of reference. Why this complexity? Just because its negotiation, its decision in uh, the European scheme is a result of a negotiation. And the, um, 
this is the reason, for example, why it took uh, three years to decide uh, the change in the calendar in the auctions, what is called, uh, I don't remember the name, the, uh, the fact that you, you reduce the, the uh, auctions. Uh, the backloading, back yes, the backloading. You know, it's a, it should be a very simple decision to, to change the auctions in, uh, on the treasury bonds. Uh, you have auctions every week in France, in Germany, in UK. The, the minister in charge of the auction changed the, the calendar according to, the, to change the calendar of the auction in the UETS. It took three years with a discussion in the parliament. You know, everything becomes very complex. Uh, I won't give a detailed uh, description of the market stability reserve, but it's, uh, trust me, a very sophisticated and very complex uh, scheme. So uh, this complexity is uh, very costly. Does this complexity bring flexibility? No. Uh, this complexity is the reflect of the fact that uh, there is a weak governance of uh, the UTS. And uh, nobody has uh, a clear power to change the rule during the uh, period. So it means that each decision you have, if you face a shock, an unexpected shock, uh, you have to start a negotiation. And this negotiation is extremely difficult because you have still 28 member states, plus three other uh, with the UTS, because you have several industries. So you have lobbies from companies, from uh, member states. But this uh, brings a system which is more complex and less flexible. Does uh, the UTS brought more predictability? Sure not. If you look at the details of the rules of the new future uh, market stability reserve, which will enter uh, into operation end of, uh, in, in 2019. In fact, uh, this uh, reserve will make impossible to predict exactly the cap, because the cap will depend of market condition uh, and will automatically be changed through some um, rules. And does the UTS give us predictability on carbon price. Oh, sorry, I'm not going in. The... What is your carbon price anticipation? I don't speak correctly in the... It's just a little quiet. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is your carbon price ex anticipation? Uh, look at this graph. We have on the graph uh, the uh, trends of the carbon price. It's uh, the blue line uh, reflects uh, uh, the, uh, two, two years um, future contract. And the red um, line represents the spot price during the first phase. What seems very clear is that uh, if you are uh, in charge of a company, if you are in charge of investing in industry, if you are uh, an economist, what, what will be your carbon price anticipation, uh, given all this information? Uh, in fact, I would say that uh, um, what we uh, can clearly see is uh, three... Uh, is a th I always go back. We can see three main drivers in the current short termings of the UTS. First, and uh, uh, what I would like to mention is that uh, this analysis is made on the UTS, but uh, many lessons we draw from the experience of the UTS, we can do the same lessons from other ETS in the world. Uh, the first one, uh, there is a clear uh, tendency to overestimate the baseline emissions in many, many situations. Uh, of course, uh, if you want to anticipate the uh, baseline emissions, uh, we have to accept that there are big uncertainties uh, in the concerning both the economic environment and the technical change. And uh, 
in a way, when uh, the people in charge of uh, UTS say that uh, the um, economic crisis is one of the main reasons of the shortcoming of the UTS, it's not completely wrong, but uh, it seems impossible to explain the, the low carbon price between uh, 2011 and 2017 by the economic shock uh, which uh, occurred in 2008-2009, you know, there are many other situations. I think um, these um, common rules of uh, overestimating the baseline emission and then to face uh, over allocate market, uh, we can see it uh, in Europe. But uh, if you look at the Regi, if you look at the Chinese pilots, if you look at the Korea, uh, it's a very frequent situation that uh, before uh, setting in operation uh, ETS, the politicians have in mind that uh, there is a risk that the carbon price to uh, rocket up to go too, too high. But two or three years after starting the market, you see that uh, the problem is that the carbon price go down. And I think uh, this uh, overestimation of the baseline emissions have uh, um, reflects many, many parameters, uh, but uh, it reflects a very um, strange situation in which uh, you have many asymmetric information. And uh, if you are a company or if you manage an installation which will enter the cap and trade, of course, your interest is to increase your, your baseline. And at each discussion on the, especially the free allowances, there is a very ambiguous uh, game between uh, lobby uh, which have the interest to uh, make a very huge uh, baseline emissions and uh, there is also a very interesting question, does the politician have in mind the risk of uh, climate change or do they have the, in mind the risk of uh, too high carbon price and uh, the risk on the competi competition on the industry. The second driver of um, the shortcomings um, of the UTS is uh, the uncontrolled entry of Kyoto certificate. Between, if you look at uh, the uh, past uh, carbon price, you will see that uh, between um, 2010 and 2012, the, we face a very clear uh, decline in the carbon price and the, the official cap was restricted. Uh, but during this, this period, we had a very important, very huge uh, entry of uh, Kyoto certificates on the market. And in fact, there was a very huge gap between the official cap and the actual cap. Um, this uh, situation was partly anticipated when the rules of the Kyoto certificate were decided uh, in, uh, the f during the first period. The idea was that the EUTS could use a part, uh, could use uh, the Kyoto certificate partly to uh, the, their compliance in Europe, but the idea was that the Kyoto certificate would be used much wider in the world by other countries, uh, by other markets. <laughs> and what happened uh, in 2019? 10 and 2011 is that all the other buyers, all the other potential buyers of Kyoto certificate uh, didn't uh, continue to be in the market. In fact, they left the market and uh, uh, Europe uh, became the only uh, buyer of Kyoto certificates and we use all the selling uh, to, to, this, uh, to the compliance at a very low cost. Uh, behind this uh, experience of Kyoto certificates, uh, there is a ge more general is issue, which is uh, very important. You see that today, many international uh, bodies uh, um, uh, defend the idea of uh, uh, linking between markets, and uh, we could enlarge the uh, carbon price, 
price signal by, by linking the carbon markets. My question is, uh, does market linkage reduce ambition in terms of carbon price signal? If, you look, if we look at many experiences, for example, in New Zealand with the CDM, uh, for example, uh, uh, California with uh, Quebec, we see that uh, when you link market, very often uh, the price will go down and will reduce the ambition of the carbon prices. So this is a real uh, issue. Third point is uh, most important. Behind the difficulties of uh, managing the UTS and behind the difficulties of um, sending a real CO2 price in Europe, uh, there is a very uh, great difficulty of coordination between uh, different policy tools. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, your institu institution uh, contributed strongly to show this. Uh, most of the UE abatements in, in Europe didn't result from uh, the carbon price. They result just from other policy which uh, decided to develop uh, renewable energy at a cost much higher than the carbon price. Uh, they result from uh, efficiency uh, uh, standards which decided to reduce uh, um, carbon emission at much higher price. So it's a possibility to uh, use those uh, uh, other instruments, but the lack of coordination uh, is dramatic uh, in Europe, and the lack of coordination uh, makes that uh, we say that the UTS should be the cornerstone of the European policy, and in fact, it's absolutely the cornerstone. It helps to uh, do the last abatement. Uh, this overlap of uh, instrument is a very frequent situation uh, when uh, I look at the assessment of uh, American economists on the uh, Californian and Quebec market. They have the same difficulty. I remind you that the SO2 uh, market, uh, which was the first uh, reference uh, at the international level, and uh, of course, I learned, I learned how Carpentrade were working with Denis Hellerman, who wrote a book on the uh, SO2 market. Uh, the SO2 market disappeared. It doesn't exist anymore because of this impossibility to uh, manage uh, the coordination between uh, policy tools and uh, this overlap of instruments. So I think, really, uh, if we look at the European uh, Trading scheme today, this, uh, the way we could uh, combine uh, carbon pricing with other policy is probably the main issue. And uh, what I, I am expecting from the future reform of the UTS is that uh, we progress in this field of uh, coordination, coordinating uh, the carbon pricing with other policy instrument. So uh, this was just uh, the summary of our conclusion, providing more simplicity, less rigidity, more predictability, and the illness, not the symptoms. Uncertainty in the baseline, coordination with the rest of the world, and coordination with other policy. My third point will be, I have still a quarter. Yes. Um, it's good because it's my third part, uh, combining price and quantity-based management. Uh, I would like to start with a very brief uh, description of the current reform, and then I would like to defend uh, my vision, which is our vision uh, in the chair, that uh, we, could, uh, we could improve the where the reform is prepared in uh, combining price and quantity management. And I will conclude in showing that uh, it could have much larger co-benefits in, in Europe than uh, broader than the um, reform of the UETS. So limits of the current reform, uh, you know probably, if, if you don't know, I will just remind you that uh, what is called the reform of the UETS uh, now. We have the scheduled rules for the fourth phase, uh, phases, 
which will be between 2021 and 2030, which uh, will be the continuation of the third phase with a more rapidly decrease in the cap, with a continuation of free allocation, which will be increased compared to the third phase with some technical rules, and the introduction of this, what is called the market stability reserve. So market stability reserve uh, will enter into uh, function, uh, I think, in 2019. And this uh, market stability reserve is really the cornerstone of the reform uh, in discussion at the European level. This uh, reserve will uh, work like a pump, reducing the amount of uh, errands in circulation when a uh, certain amount of the cap of the uh, what do you call of the bank uh, allowances, which they call the surplus, will be reached, and uh, the pump could uh, reinject some allowances on the market when the level of the of the uh, what is the bank? of the bank uh, is low. So uh, there is no explicit carbon price target. There is no explicit price triggers. Uh, just uh, the surplus, what is called the surplus, is uh, the, the threshold triggering a quota withdrawal. And uh, this brings uh, an automatic adjustment of the cap in the short term. And there are some other provisions which could enter into operation starting on 20. Uh, 24, which could uh, transform this uh, allowance in the reserve, uh, cancelling them. So it could be uh, definitely uh, cut in the cap. So uh, first, we we try to. Uh, this is a pure um, pure quantity uh, management of the reserve, and uh, this will be the first time. I, I think we have explored all the cap and trade scheme in the world, uh, in the chair. I think it's a unique scheme. I never saw other uh, um, market stability reserve operating with such pure quantity rules. We try to uh, see uh, how we could uh, represent this introduction of the market stability reserve in the, our simulation model uh, called Zephyr. And very rapidly, uh, I'm not a good specialist of models. Uh, my um, understanding is that uh, Zephyr simulation shows that uh, sometimes uh, uh, the risk uh, is, could be more instability than less uh, instability uh, because uh, uh, the introduction of those rules will change the anticipation of the market player. And it's very difficult to modelize how the market player will anticipate, uh, will change their anticipation. Uh, from a practical point of view, can, can this pure quantity-based management be implemented? I do think that in the short term, uh, it will be extremely difficult for one simple reason. The information you need uh, will be available uh, almost two years uh, after um, the, the beginning of the, of, of the uh, period. It means that if you have a, a disequilibrium in the market, you have to wait two years to have all the information to uh, operate your market stability reserve with a, tri with a trigger, which would be the carbon price you just have all the information in the price, uh, day by day. You know. so, uh, before working in the carbon, I spent uh, almost 10 years of my life working on uh, agriculture issues and agriculture market. You know, and I, I, work at, I worked on the stability of market, uh, beef market, wheat market, uh, corn market. What do we do? We use some mechanisms very similar to market stability reserve. But the trigger is, not, is never the quantity, it's always the price, just because you have the information immediately. Medium and long term, I think that the quantity-based management uh, could work if we had a very different governance of the 
uh, market with the equivalent of a carbon central bank, just because uh, we would need to have one body in charge of changing the cap if the market conditions uh, need to change this cap. And uh, this could be done just uh, very rapidly if there is a shock, but not waiting for uh, the result of an automatic um, rules. So uh, my vision is that uh, this uh, unique uh, quantity corridors, which could be uh, set up, uh, would be first very difficult to manage in the short run because of the delay of information and that uh, in the medium and long term it would need another governance to be uh, well managed. So my uh, recommendation would be, and uh, this recommendation is also the recommendation of uh, the French government, uh, my recommendation uh, would be to substitute uh, quantity corridor by a price corridor. And just to do uh, what other people in charge of carbon market do around the world. They do it in California, Quebec, they do it in the Reggie, they do it in some Chinese uh, market. I don't know exactly how they operate in Korea. Uh, but technically it's very easy to implement just change uh, the triggers of the stability market reserve and instead of a quantity of the level of the surplus, you take a price level that you have to decide. And this price level could be a threshold at the floor level, at the sailing level. Between the thresholds, you have a quantity-based mechanism and at the thresholds, you change the system which becomes which becomes a price-based mechanism. And what is a price-based mechanism? Uh, if we speak, uh, I, I, I wanted to say, if you speak in French, or if you speak in current English, a price-based mechanism means a tax. You change uh, cap and trade in a tax system, in fact. Uh, and in the current situation, uh, uh, in the EU ETS, if we change the... Uh, if we introduce such a price corridor, my assessment is that uh, you will transform the cap and trade scheme in a quasi-tax system me mechanism for years, because you have a huge surplus. And as soon as you introduce a carbon floor, you will um, incentive. We, you, you will send the incentive to the company to uh, reduce more the emission, to abate more the emission. So you will increase the surplus. It means that, uh, the, in fact, the cap and trade will uh, clearly be transformed into a tax system. Uh, this tax system uh, has uh, much limited adverse effects and, uh, uh, of an overlap with other policies and the cap and trade system, because it's much easier to combine a tax with other policies in the CAP system. There is a very good uh, article by Larry on this subject. So, uh, if, we, if we did this, uh, I think we would um, change the, the position of uh, the UTS in the carbon pricing map worldwide. You know, if you look at the carbon pricing map worldwide in 2016, this comes from the excellent um, carbon pricing uh, state and trade uh, um, document by the World Bank, all the countries in which you have a real price signals, they use tax or quasi-tax. And most of the country in which you have very low carbon price, you have uh, ETS or f tax of one or two uh, euro or dollar per tons, like in Poland, but it's a joke, you know, it's not a real tax. So, uh, with this um, reform, uh, combining uh, quantity and uh, price uh, management be uh, political feasible? Of course, it's always quite complicated to, to change a scheme and to introduce a quasi-tax scheme. Uh, I speak by experience in the case of France, in which uh, I was involved in the introduction of carbon tax uh, three years ago, uh, four years ago. Uh, 
I think there are four points from a political point of view, standpoint. First is the legal risk. Uh, the rules are not the same in the European Union when you set up tax and when you set up cap and trade. Uh, if you introduce a price floor, you introduce a crazy tax. You face a, a legal risk. If one country doesn't want this floor, it will say it's, not, it's no more a cap and trade, it's a, uh, it's a crazy tax. It's a risk, but if you never take risk, you never made any decision. Uh, second point, uh, it's clear that uh, if the carbon price uh, increase significantly in Europe, you have to manage huge distribution effects between countries. It costs not uh, many euro uh, in France to introduce a carbon floor because uh, we have a very decarbonized uh, power uh, system. If you introduce this the same tax in Germany, you pay much more. If you introduce the same tax in Poland, so we have to manage those uh, distributional effects. And we, if we don't manage them, of course, we will never uh, price correctly carbon in Europe. This is a political uh, condition. The same at the international level. The problem of the COP21 and COP22 is uh, what kind of distributional um, transfer can we provide in. Uh, to fight climate change. Third, impacts of the cost of energy. Uh, I think the main uh, macroeconomic uh, impact of such a carbon flow would come through the cost of energy. And um, we have also uh, to manage uh, international, possible international carbon leakage for covered sectors. But have in mind that the, the real, the two main problems for me are first distributional effect between countries and impact of cost of energy before uh, the risk of international carbon leakage for covered sector because I do think that uh, those covered sector in reality faced less uh, risk than uh, they try to say. A uh, major issue is the level of the price corridor. I'm finished in five minutes, I'm sorry. I, uh, to take a little more time. Uh, how could we um, find a good uh, level of this price corridor? It's, the question is not to say uh, carbon price in one year, but to, to give a trajectory, a medium trajectory. Uh, using the social cost of carbon, uh, of course, uh, it's uh, what uh, we find in the textbooks, but it's quite difficult because, um, for example, if you take uh, the social post cost of carbon, which is uh, calculated in the US, which was calculated, I think they will stop to make this calculation, uh, unfortunately, uh, for political reasons, you think. But uh, uh, since uh, the beginning of the uh, uh, 2010s, um, the government agency uh, provide uh, social cost of carbon. The problem is that uh, it changes during times because uh, from uh, between, uh, you see, 2010 and 2013, the level and the slope of the uh, social cost of carbon has changed. Oh, difficult to trust completely economists when they will give you a trajectory. So we could maybe use a more empirical rules, which would be a, a cost efficiency approach, trying to find the good carbon price which fit with some trajectory of uh, uh, emission abatement. Very difficult. If you look uh, uh, at the European situation, very difficult because, uh, in fact, uh, the same level of carbon price will have very different impacts depending on the energy prices. You have of, on this uh, map uh, quite interesting um, information. The horizontal line at 30 euro represents what would be the uh, carbon price floor at 30 euro per ton of CO2. Under this line, you have uh, the actual carbon price since 2008. And you see that this carbon price is for the uh, now uh, under 5 euros per ton and under 10 euros per ton since 2011. And um, uh, 
you have a representation of the coal to gas switching price zone, which is the zone in which you start to switch from coal uh, to gas to produce uh, electricity. The uh, limit, you start to uh, switch when the less, uh, when the, the price change the competition between the less efficient coal power plant towards the most efficient uh, gas plant. And then you, you, so you see that uh, uh, for the same level of carbon price since uh, 2008, some years, uh, you could uh, switch all the gas to coal, only with, with the information given by, by the price. And some other years, uh, you were under the sw switching zone. So it's quite difficult to have this rule. So uh, my conclusion would be that, uh, um, in fact, uh, there is no perfect formula uh, to determine the level and the trajectory of the carbon price you need to introduce. And this has to be, uh, in fact, uh, very with many pedagogy, with uh, specific governance, but this is a political choice. And the economists don't have uh, the um, ideal formula to give to the politics. Conclusion. My conclusion is that, um, in fact, if we take uh, some distance with the current reform, in fact, in 1990, there was the first attempt to price carbon in Europe by the European Commission. And this project was to introduce um, harmonized carbon tax in industry and energy. Most of the country didn't follow. Some uh, were strong opponents, especially our good friends from the UK. And um, some countries uh, implemented such reforms in north of Europe, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, Holland. Then since uh, 2005, we have developed these uh, common tools, which is called the UTS. And today we have a very strange situation in which we have three cases for the CO2 European emissions. First, uh, in the energy and industry sector, almost 50% of the CO2 emissions are under the UTS. And it means that uh, today, uh, they are priced at uh, between 4.5, 6 uh, euro per tons. At this level, uh, it's very seldom that you just you switch from coal to gas. Depends of the energy price, not from the carbon price. Then uh, you have in the other sector, which mainly are uh, um, transportation, uh, building, and agriculture. Uh, you have two situations. You have a situation in which you have another carbon price, which is a domestic carbon price. And uh, in this case, uh, in some countries, uh, this domestic carbon price can reach more than 100 euro per tonne in Sweden. Today it's uh, 30.5 in France. It's 25, I think, in Ireland. You know, it depends from one country to another. So you have this kind of mosaic. And you have a third part of the uh, CO2 emission, which are the other sector in which there, there are no uh, domestic tax. So they are tax-free. I think this is uh, completely stupid that in Europe you have three ways to price carbon to zero, domestic carbon price, EUTS, and one main goal should be to harmonize in the future uh, this carbon price towards a more unified system. When you are involved in an um, experience of uh, domestic carbon price in the non eutS as I was in France, it's always very complicated to explain to the people that uh, if you are in uh, the domestic situation, you will pay a tax of uh, 30.5 euros starting in 1st uh, January this year. And if you are capped under the UTS, you pay only uh, 5 euros. It's very complicated <laughs> politically. So. Uh, I think that uh, one uh, huge co-benefit uh, from combining uh, tax, uh, um, from combining uh, price and quantity mechanism uh, in the management of the UTS is that it would help to have uh, medium-term targets, 
which could be targets both for the uh, emission under the EUTS and the domestic uh, emissions that are not uh, under the EUTS, but that should be also priced if we want uh, to move uh, Europe rapidly toward a low carbon economy. Thank you, Xavier, for your attention. And thank you for your invitation. It was a great pleasure to be with you today. And I would be very happy to discuss those points with you. OK, thanks uh, a lot, Christian. I think it was um, a very interesting presentation and also um, um, quite appealing. Uh, difficult to to ask many questions because you already you already uh, answered uh, and, and put yourself uh, all these questions uh, and, and answered uh, some of them. So let me um, give the floor first to the people attending who are here in Florence, uh, and then we'll we'll go to the to the public uh, outside if we received any 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 emails. So. Any question on your on your side here? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, thank you, uh, Christian, for the very nice presentation. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I perfectly see that your uh, um, proposal, which is also the proposal of the French government, I understand, uh, um, identifies, uh, I mean, clear uh, weaknesses in the in the ETS and. Um, with which probably most people would uh, would agree, um, but as you said, you also identified uh, uh, two the main barriers to your uh, proposals, which are the legal risk the, uh, in uh, in shifting from a, a quantity uh, mechanism to a quasi tax uh, system. Uh, so legal issue for you know for this to be agreed at the EU level, and then the uh, the second. Uh, issue of the distributional effects um, between countries uh, stemming from this uh, uh, price collar. Um, so while I agree with your analysis uh, largely about the problems that we have in the in the system, uh, I wonder what it's you know about your diagnosis for you know dealing with these two uh, problems. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, first, I have uh, no uh, uh, miracle, miracle solution, you know. Uh, I think uh, the legal issue uh, would be impossible to tackle if we wanted to set up immediately a tax, a pure tax. If the change is not explicitly introducing a tax, but introducing a, pr a price corridor, it's easier to defend with the lawyers. And I would add, I would add something that um, it's very strange uh, when you introduce a domestic carbon tax, and I was involved in this uh, uh, operation in France, if you go on the TV and say, I will introduce a carbon tax, uh, it will be very difficult, extremely difficult. If you change the way you calculate an existing tax, and to, if you don't call it tax, but uh, for example, climate contribution, it becomes easier, including with the legal issue. I was personally involved in two. Uh, um, uh, operation uh, for uh, domestic carbon tax, the first one in 29 and the second one in 2013. In 29, there was a huge debate and uh, the carbon tax uh, promoted by uh, Sarkozy was blocked by the Constitutional uh, Council in France, which is the highest uh, uh, public body to, to, to decide if uh, the tax is uh, legal. And the second uh, uh, operation was in 2013, when I was sharing the uh, 
uh, Green Tax Committee, we can translate like this. And we didn't have legal issues because we worked very gradually and uh, we, it was uh, very, very discreet. You know, we, we'd have, we didn't have a huge debate and um, many people didn't know, in fact, that we were doing it. I think uh, the legal issue is, uh, with such a reform, much easier to pass than uh, an explicit uh, carbon tax. Distributional effects, I think, I do think that uh, uh, the, one of the main reasons why it is very difficult to manage the UETS is that uh, the distributional effects are never explicitly discussed. First, the free allowances. When we uh, discuss the question of free allowance, we are a pure distributional effect between the company outside energy system. And uh, as economists, uh, we all of us, we have heard from the double dividend. So we have, I, I never say that uh, economists have solutions because it's very complicated in the real life. But we could imagine that uh, the um, rules of the double dividend could help in uh, allocating these, those free allowances between companies and between and this is never explicitly done. Free allowance is a pure uh, result of very complicated discussion in which uh, different lobbies defend their interests. And we see clearly that uh, where the lobbyists are strong because uh, very often they are in monopoly situations, they have m more results. Distributional effect between countries and uh, the question, the issue of uh, how to uh, uh, redistribute the auction revenues has never been explicitly discussed. Just we put a small part for the uh, innovation and a small part for Eastern countries, but uh, uh, we have to be serious if we want to reach. Uh, carbon price at 50 or 100 euro per ton of CO2. This will have huge uh, distributional effect between countries. The same in the international negotiation. And we have to politically uh, tackle with those questions. And this is never done, you know. So I, I think this is one of the major reasons why uh, it's very difficult to go uh, uh, further in this reform. Uh, because those distributional uh, impacts are very important and they should be discussed at the highest political level. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Francois, for, the, for your very, very nice talk. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of comments. One is, uh, you, you at the beginning mentioned the complexity and uncertainty of the instrument, no? and, and I agree, and I would say that the, the fact that it's complex is also less transparent, especially for people who is not uh, uh, expert of this field. Uh, but, and your proposal of having a price corridor, you mentioned you know, the, the problem of this proposal. One of these is also to define exactly the price. There are several methods and so on. There is not a risk that we shift the complexity from the details of the UTS to the details on discussing which price, how, how to do it, and so on. And <clears throat> the second is, I think that the main element of, of, of the reason of the low carbon price is the crisis, uh, which uh, I think in your, in your, in your uh, uh, framework is, I think, a story of the baseline. Uh, which uh, it was not foreseen, but it was not only foreseen in, in, in environmental policy, it was not foreseen in, in, in no one, I mean, <laughs> foreseen it, so it was, 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 was a common problem. And, uh, and I think that the other element, of course, added to, to this, like the interaction with other policy, uh, but I think that the crisis was the real main driver for the low uh, carbon price, and I would like to know your opinion on this. Uh, 
Um, first, uh, uh, I like your first question very much <laughs> because I see it, it, it's um, a very good question. Um, to be honest, if we had to, uh, if we had the liberty to set up a completely new scheme to price carbon in Europe today. If we uh, were free to, to move uh, in uh, any new uh, scheme, completely different from the UTS, what would we do? Myself, I think I would set up a much more simple scheme that a cap and trade, I would set up a tax. I, I would go back to the situation in 1990, and I say it very, um, very simply. Uh, not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, you know, in France, very often the question of tax versus cap and trade is uh, part of a more larger ideological uh, discussion. Myself, I was uh, very enthusiastic by the cap and trade when we set up. I contributed with Denis and Fran to write this book, Pricing Carbon, which was, uh, in my view today, not enough critical <laughs> because we were very positive for the first three years of this market. And I contributed uh, personally in France to uh, develop uh, the registries and uh, the marketplace and so I, my assessment today and I, I, I changed since I came back uh, since I came uh, five years ago in this uh, not in this room but in this institute um, my idea is that um, the management of cap and trade is too much complicated for several reasons but one of them uh, which is uh, very important in, in the real life is that politicians know what a tax is. Just a very few politicians understand what a cap and trade is. And, though, and when they have to decide, because the, the functioning of our society, I think it's much better like this. It's not that economists are in, power, in charge of governance and power. <laughs> politicians are. I think that uh, uh, I would effectively uh, uh, recommend a tax. This is not possible given the reality. So my idea in reality is that changing the price, the quantity uh, corridor by a price corridor, price collar, is the first step to move towards a more simple scheme in which uh, the price uh, management is uh, determinant. Uh, you are right that uh, the way we move from this pure quantity scheme towards a mixture of quantity in the price-based mechanism uh, could be more complicated. And if it's more complicated during a long time, it won't be a success. So I think it's extremely important <laughs> to, to, to have this in mind. Um, but this seems to be, to me, the, the best recommendation I, I could do today with the experience we have on those uh, long years of experience, 12 years of experience now of COTS and other experience in the world. Uh, and in some, uh, I think, if you look at uh, all the ETS operating in the world today, where there is a uh, right price signals, you always have a price floor. Because in fact, in California, Quebec, uh, 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 most of Chinese uh, pilots, it, it, the price is, is at the floor. Now the baseline and the um, uh, economic crisis, I don't think that uh, uh, the it depends on what we call economic crisis. Um, we had a very strong shock in 1928 uh, 29 with a strong decline in um, output, especially in the industrial, in the industry which are capped, you know. 
But I think it's absolutely impossible to explain the overallocation uh, on the market and the surplus, what they call the surplus on the market between 2011 and 2016 uh, by these economic conditions. The first reason why there is this surplus is that uh, many, many uh, countries uh, uh, triggered uh, abatement uh, with much higher uh, costs uh, through feed-in tariffs and uh, energy uh, policies. And this is the main um, challenge for the EUTS reform. Uh, we'll never have the capacity to anticipate uh, economic shock or technical shock. We have the duty uh, to coordinate the different uh, policy instruments. Um, another point I would like to mention is that um, when you look at the expectation, the economic condition expected by uh, players uh, which enter in a cap and trade. The same, the same uh, this is an asymmetric uh, uh, game, you know. The same company, uh, when they complain uh, before the European Commission and the national governments, because economic conditions are very difficult, because they need money, they subsidize uh, The same uh, uh, company, they show you uh, baseline with uh, very inc rapidly uh, increasing outputs uh, to have good baseline and good uh, allocation. So I think uh, this is also a very important point. Uh, thanks for, for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, well, so one of the main things that the UTS had, one of the main issues, was the free allowances in, in the sense that, okay, I mean, only the energy sector is having the, the allowances auctioned. So, and this, and the big rationale behind this, behind having free allowances is this carbon leakage, you know, that you mentioned was, you mentioned that this was the third of the, of the issues, no, after distributional problems and so on. So my question would be, okay, if we had a, a carbon price in, this, in such a situation where the industry is loving to have, to remain with the free allowances, how would this, what is, what is your opinion in this sense? No, okay, you are putting a, a carbon price of 30 euros. So, well, the rationale behind carbon leakage is just become stronger, no? Well, once you put the carbon, the carbon flow. So how would, how would you, Uh, first, I just uh, wanted to make a precision. Uh, my recommendation wouldn't to set up a 30 euro per ton carbon price today. Uh, you know, I think what is important is to discuss, uh, to find a price corridor increasing in time. And the level of the initial point is not the more important for me. The most important is the credibility of the price corridor during the time. Uh, but I will answer your question. Uh, you won't be completely surprised if I tell you that, uh, in fact, I don't think that the free allocation is a good way to distribute uh, allowances. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, um, it is uh, very, um, the, the more it lasts, the worse it is, you know. Uh, so um, my idea would be that uh, we should uh, move uh, toward a, a scheme in which we have a larger part of the allowances which would be auctioned. But we should have a very uh, precise discussion to discuss uh, the distribution of the auction revenues. And for me, the best way to help the politician to make the decision as an economist is uh, the idea of the double dividend. A cap and trade scheme with uh, auctions is very similar to a tax. Just the, the, the level of the tax is not known in advance, but the, it's a quasi-tax. So I, I would say that uh, this would be the best scheme. 
Uh, and then uh, the way you redistribute the auction uh, between industry uh, could be very different uh, in uh, industry which face very different uh, situation in some situation. And I think the, we have to be very um, practice. You know, it, it's an empirical decision. It's not a pure theoretical decision in, in some circumstances. Th there is. Uh, very minor risk of uh, carbon leakage. I think the, the carbon leakage has been uh, overestimated in uh, uh, Europe since the beginning for uh, very uh, simple reasons. That many people have uh, interest in <laughs> this, <laughs> um, uh, in this, um, how do you say, in, uh, in, the, in this risk of uh, supposed risk on carbon leakage. Uh, in some circumstances, um, if you look at the cement industry, we could imagine that uh, we protect the industry through, through a carbon tax at the border, an, an adjustment border. It could, could be uh, very simply, it, it could be quite simply to, to implement, and uh, uh, the part of the industry which is in competition is always in harbors, you know. In some uh, other um, industries, it's much more complicated. I have in mind uh, chemical industries or steel industries, in which uh, I think uh, the best way would be to uh, auction and then to redistribute uh, proportional to the labor costs, you know, uh, independently of the level of emission, of course, because uh, I want to give the uh, produce of the revenue from the auction independently of the emission, otherwise I don't need to set up carbon trust. So I think that this is a very good question. Uh, no simple answer, but uh, it's clear that uh, uh, free allocation is not the best way to distribute allowances in the industry. Any questions uh, from yeah, A few the questions, public? but I think you already answered uh, practically all of them. One ask. Uh, how is it feasible in EU from political point of view to get price corridor? Another one comment, instead of a price uh, um, carbon uh, price and floor, is no better to put the effort to implement just a carbon tax. Uh, another question, you mentioned distributional issue from the carbon tax, aren't there distributional issue also for the UTS? And uh, I think you have already mentioned, uh, talk about this. The last one is, uh, they ask your opinion on the Brexit and the UTS, uh, what effect will have? Uh, thank you for this uh, last question, uh, which is <laughs> uh, quite complicated. I if you look at, at the slide I uh, um, showed at the beginning, uh, you will see that uh, it's the first one. No, you continue. Yes, no. No, no, it was, it was this one. Yes, you see that on the phase four, uh, on uh, uh, countries' recovery, I wrote the same, uh, point d'interrogation, uh, question, question, question mark, yes, and then UK, question mark, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> probably uh, the participant showed, uh, had a look at this uh, um, graph. So uh, I think it's a major point and uh, it's absolutely not clear for me. Uh, uh, and when uh, I have no clear idea, I ask questions. So I ask questions uh, uh, in three directions. The first one was in our colleagues in the UK. Uh, my second uh, interlocutors were uh, two uh, companies operating in the UK and in the continent. And the third company was civil servants uh, working in the European Commission, and I had no clear answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, first, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, we now could, can consider that the Brexit uh, will uh, uh, be a real uh, major political decision, and uh, we don't know exactly how it will um, impact the um, uh, UK. Uh, my personal um, idea is that um, it will be very difficult if. Uh, the general context of the negotiation is what is called a hard Brexit, uh, to have a scheme uh, comparable to the scheme with uh, Norway or 
uh, other small country we don't belong to the European Union but which participate to the ETS. If uh, our friends from the UK uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, 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 it is exit. <laughs> you know? uh, it will be a hard shock for the UETS. It will be a hard shock because uh, it will be difficult to anticipate uh, what uh, the impact could be on the market equilibrium for two reasons. The first one is that since the beginning of uh, the UETS, uh, the UK uh, had a real constraint on its uh, installations. And they played uh, since the beginning uh, very well the, the game uh, of the UETS. But with the national uh, tax you know, on the power sector, now they have a very specific uh, inclusion of, uh, so it's, it's, it's a good question. It's difficult to answer now. I had no better vision asking people uh, um, more close uh, to the real life. And my opinion is that it will be difficult to maintain the UK in the UTS in the context of hard Brexit. And this will increase uh, the task of the people in charge of UTS reform. But it could be also an opportunity to go further or further in the reform. Okay, it's uh, 4.30. We, we took uh, more than half an hour for questions, both for the, from the public and also from, from, from people uh, following us. Um, I, I think it was a very interesting and, and timely uh, discussion because, as you know, uh, we are in the process of, of change of the UTS. We are in the process also of the introduction of, of systems in, in other countries with similar debates, as, as Christian indicated uh, before. And I think uh, the approach by Christian was cautious, right? I mean, he didn't cl claim to, to have uh, answers to, to the questions, just uh, to foster the debate. And of course, uh, he had some opinions on some topics, not on all, and, and some suggestions. Um, I'm not going to do more questions because I think that uh, he already <laughs> As I said before, I answered uh, many of my of my possible questions, and then the public and also the, the, the those attending by uh, through the uh, internet. But what I would say is, um, you know, taking some some reflections in in a, in a meeting organized by the German government last week uh, here in northern uh, Italy. Um, I would like to, 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 to try to, to have some, some wider reflection on, 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 on this topic, right? And, and perhaps um, the first uh, reflection deals with the, with the lack of success that we have had as, as economists on, 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 on carbon pricing particularly or environmental pricing in general. I think we haven't been very successful in, in convincing the society in general and, and, and many policymakers in particular. And, um, and actually, some of the people attending this this uh, this event to discuss the future of, of climate policies and, and climate uh, and, energy and economics research in this area uh, were quite um, um, suggesting that perhaps we should um, uh, put this uh, in a wider setting, right, uh, and, and talk more about uh, policy package to attain some targets, and not only targets in terms of CO2 emissions, but targets, you know, within, you know, sustainable development kind of uh, um, setting, uh, because the other reflection there was that perhaps we shouldn't talk a lot about uh, climate policies, but about economic policies or socio-economic socio policies to try to solve uh, the climate issue and other issues simultaneously, right? So, so, so I, I, I would 
perhaps like to 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 finish with this uh, overall uh, debate on 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 the importance of prices of course we are economists and we know that they are important but as part of 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 policy packages and some of the problems that we saw could be solved and also by 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 putting this in a wider setting with with the sustainable development goals or with other societal um, um, objectives, uh, we would probably be able to convince people that uh, a big, big change is necessary, and not only for for the sake of the climate, but overall for many for many issues. Another topic that was raised there was the the, the issue of lobbying and how. Uh, lobbying, which may be related to some sectors that are really uh, losers in this process, or some sectors that are um, uh, related to the international dimension of uh, climate policies. You know, we were discussing about leakage, etc. Well, these lobbies may prevent the attainment of proper um, prices, and, and, and perhaps. You know, sometimes I wonder what would happen um, today with uh, 1990 eco tax or 1992 eco tax if it was uh, finally implemented. Could it be 20 euros, 30 euros, or more closely to the five euros that we have in the UETS? And, and my opinion is that perhaps um, ceteris paribus we could be uh, more towards the, the the situation that we are seeing in the in the UTS. But these are general reflections. I don't want uh, to take more time, and I don't expect that you um, answer, I don't know whether if you want to, to comment anything. And with this, we could uh, close the, the, um, and the, the seminar. May I just, uh, uh, two points. First, uh, I completely in accordance with you, uh, carbon price is just part of the story. Uh, the most important uh, to convince the politici politici politicians and uh, the society is that uh, is a low carbon society better than a high carbon society. This is a real uh, issue. And what I try to do uh, in some books, notably Green Capital, which I wrote after um, carbon pricing, is uh, through uh, the double dividend, trying to show how we could combine green uh, taxes or uh, cap and trade schemes with good distributive e effects, which would provide a better quality of growth. Th this is, I think, the, the main uh, goal. Well, then the sustainable development, of course, it's. Uh, important, but uh, very often it's very difficult to see what in uh, sustainable development is uh, pure communication and what is uh, economy policy. <laughs> uh, lobbying and uh, carbon tax and uh, cap and trade. Um, the example of Sweden shows that uh, a country, small, very internalized, uh, with a high degree of uh, the competition and its industry has uh, raised the uh, domestic uh, CO2 uh, tax uh, up to 110 euros per ton of CO2. So there are examples. Would uh, a carbon, European carbon tax still be at five? Uh, maybe, of course, uh, in a way you're right. Uh, the same lobbyist will play against the carbon tax, you know. So my opinion is that probably the complexity of the UTS, the fact that uh, this instrument is very technocratic, not uh, um, easy to manage by politicians in such uh, this complexity and this uh, scheme is uh, maybe... Uh, um, better for the lobbyist than a pure tax, you know. Because uh, I think uh, <laughs> with a tax, you know, the politician knows the rules. It's 
more clear, you know, with this complexity, you know. It's very, very incredible the, the number of hours that people spend to discuss on this benchmark and nobody knows exactly what is behind. <laughs> but at the end of the day, price is at 5.5, at 4.5 euro per ton of CO2. Well, <laughs> but thank you very much. Uh, really, I, I wanted to thank you very much, uh, Xavier, for this invitation. It was a great pleasure to be with you. I'm uh, uh, very um, happy uh, to meet your young researchers. And I hope that we will continue to work uh, closely in connection between the Climate Economic Chair and uh, your team. And if you invite me in five years, I will come back and maybe in five years, the CO2 price will be much higher <laughs> than today. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Christian. A pleasure.